to the word of God. Can I take just a moment and look at you? You just look so good. You don't look like nothing you've been through. You don't look like you've been through a storm, a test, a trial, a tribulation, a pandemic, a sickness, a disease, an affliction, a divorce, a crisis, a dilemma, a stress attack, a trauma. You just looking so good with your saved and sanctified self. You look like Jesus has been keeping you, preserving you, making a way for you, providing for you. Is there anybody here that Jesus has been keeping you alive through hell and high water? He's been keeping you alive. Make some noise in this house. Let me hear. I believe with all my heart I have a word from God. I believe it is a prophetic word. I believe it's going to speak to somebody and I believe it's going to deliver somebody. Before I give you my scripture, I want us to act like we're not at church. I want us to act like you're talking to your best friend and we're hanging out at Starbucks and we're having a latte. Yeah, we're having a latte. I can't spell it, but I can drink it. Yeah. We're, we're having a latte and we're having it with that special uh, 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 pumpkin bread they make, you know. Yeah, that bread that's juicy when you bite into it, that don't have no calories in it because you prayed in tongues and all the calories just drip. You know the one I'm talking about. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. You know the one I'm talking about. Glory to God. And we're just going, we're going, I'm going to let you hear me and Jesus have a conversation about this text. It is in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 17, verse 1 through 10. I'm reading out of the King James Version. No particular reason I study out of all of them, but I think I read out of King James because it's old and I'm old. <laughs> and we've been hanging out so long, it ain't no need us breaking up now. Yeah. <laughs> Then said he unto his disciples, Shh, he's not talking to anybody but his disciples. It is impossible but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than for him that, that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother does trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee and saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. This is my favorite part. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> They said, we're all right with forgiving you one time, but if it's seven times 70, you're going to have to do some work on me to increase our faith. <laughs> That's being honest, isn't it? Increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as of a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the having, and, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey him. Notice that this time, Jesus says something that he says before differently. The first time he says, if you have the faith as of a grain of a mustard seed, you shall speak to the mountain. But this time he doesn't use the mountain as an analogy. This time he says, if you have the faith as of a grain of a mustard seed. Now mustard seed is so teensy, weensy, itsy, bitsy that it would fit right in between my fingers like that. He said, if you have the faith as of a grain of a mustard seed, you might say to this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the what? By the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him, by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, 
and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, when you have forgiven seven times seventy, when you have done all those things that I have commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. That's more word than some of y'all read in a month. <laughs> that ought to last you a day. So I'm going to use something I never use. I'm going to use a subject and a subtopic because I couldn't choose between the two. And one of them sounds uh, real cool and one of them sounds real intellectual. So I'm going to use both of them, okay? So the subject is defense against offenses. Defense against offenses. And the subtopic is get out of your feelings. Get out of your feelings. So one of them ought to grab you. You pick the one you like. <laughs> Can we stand and have prayer before I go into this? Yeah. Ooh, I like the sound of them. All them seats going up. That just sounds rumbling like I'm in a great big stadium, which I am. That's so cool. Can y'all hear me up in the balcony? Yeah, y'all got in here, didn't you? Glory to God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh like dew in the morning. Cascade upon us. Open up our tendency to be religious and superficial and expose the innermost sanctums of our heart that we might receive, ingest, digest, and appropriate the word of God. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do here tonight in Victory Church at Potter's House and all around the world wherever people are listening that lives would be changed, that marriages would be changed, that ministries would be changed, that workplaces would be changed, that hearts would be changed, that the power of the Holy Spirit would get so deep down inside of us that we are freed on the inside, freed in our hearts. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me hear victory praise. Come on, show part of house what a victory praise sounds like. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Woo! I feel good. Glory to God. I feel like doing a split. I'm not going to do it, but I feel like doing a split. I'm like James Brown after he got in his 60s. When he was in his 30s, he did a split. You know what I'm talking about? When he got in his 60s, he kind of got it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. That's it. Right there. When I was a young man, I danced in the spirit. I danced so long they'd have to put me in the car, and I'd still be dancing. Now that I'm older, I act like I'm going to dance. Yeah. Fake them out. God is good. We are fearfully and marvelously made. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are unique, authentic, autonomous, individually defined by the master himself. We are a designer's original in a category all by ourselves. There has never been another you. And there will never be another you again. Even if you have a twin, it's not you. God has put so much detail in the specificity that even your fingerprint stands in a category all by itself. God himself shows up in the scriptures. The very first time we see him, we see him stooping over clay. 
the stooping God shows us that all throughout the book of Genesis, God will be stooping to reach us. He stoops down and he forms man from the dust of the earth and man is just a ceramic, a clay pot until he breathes the breath of life into him and he becomes a living soul. The word living soul in the Hebrew is nephish. He becomes aware of himself. He's not just alive like a rose bush or a plant or collard greens or potatoes or, or, or anything like I'm kind of hungry, so, you know. <laughs> All of my illustrations will be food illustrations tonight. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but he becomes aware of himself. If you cut a rose bush, it doesn't scream. If, if you cut celery, it doesn't cry. But because we are aware of ourselves, we have feelings. And the gift of feelings is unique. We are created in the likeness and the image of God. God has feelings. The Bible says, and the Lord was angry with wrath, which means anger with fire. God has feelings. God has feelings. Jesus comes to Lazarus' uh, funeral service and weeps with Mary and Martha. God has feelings. And we need feelings. I know this is a faith church, but we need feelings. Faith and feelings are not necessarily at odds with each other. We need feelings. We were created to be a feeling species. If we had no feelings, we'd have no love. We would have no love. And then how could God ask us to love him with all our heart and our mind and our soul if we couldn't feel anything? Our feelings are a gift to us. Besides, the Bible says we can be touched. He can be touched by the feelings of our infirmity, tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. God cares how you feel. And so he wants us to have feelings. He doesn't want us to be led by feelings. But he wants us to have feelings. He wants us to have feelings, so there is a natural feeling we have when we birth a child. There's a natural protectiveness that we have over a child. You can take the teeny, eeny, bitsiest woman in this room and mess with her kid, and she will turn into a serial killer. <laughs> I would rather fight any dude in the room right now than to fight an angry mama because God equipped a mama with feelings. I mean, fathers will you know, knock you out too. They'll bust your chops. But a mama will pull your teeth out of your gums and look at you like you are chopped liver and say, don't go near my child again. God gives us those feelings and those instincts so that we might be protective and so that we might be corrective and so that we might have empathy. And we need those feelings. These feelings cause children to be feel loved and to feel safe and to feel nurtured. But the problem is those feelings, as many wonderful things as they do, can also do negative things. We can get hurt in our feelings. We can get bruised in our feelings. We can get disappointed in our feelings. We can be forsaken in our feelings. We can be rejected in our feelings and not even show anybody because you can't see a feeling. If you break your leg, you can see a broken leg. If you break your arm, you can see a broken arm. A broken heart cannot be seen. A broken heart cannot be seen and it is impossible to treat. There is no prescription for a broken heart. For a disappointed child who was not raised by their parents, there is no prescription that will take away that pain. There are feelings that we have to manage in order to be successful. We have to manage them like you have to manage money. You have to budget your feelings. You have to put guardrails around your feelings. You have to control your feelings because if you listen at your feelings, you'll make snap decisions that you later regret. I often say, never make permanent decisions over temporary circumstances. Because in a temporary moment of passion, you can make a permanent decision that you live to regret. 
Feelings are very, very important to us, but they must be managed. He became a living soul means that he had a place to warehouse his feelings so that your feelings are not homeless. They are sheltered in your soulish man, not exhibited in your body, not shown in the way you walk. And so if you are wounded in your feelings, you can hide it. And nobody can see it, and nobody can know it, and you can smile and say, Good morning. Welcome to J.C. Penney's. <laughs> and nobody's ever the wiser to the fact that you have a broken heart, that you have a broken marriage, that you don't feel comfortable on your own job. That you wonder why your mother didn't raise you or why she treated your sister better than she treated you or why they never asked you to sing a solo unless it's solo. <laughs> and it hurts your feelings and we have all of these feelings and in the beginning of the text when Jesus is talking to his disciples he is talking to them about feelings. And it's the first thing, when I started reading this text, I said, Lord, you spent all of those verses, 11 verses, talking to us about how we feel. And I, I got teary-eyed and I said, thank you for caring about how I feel. Thank you for caring about how I feel because I'm not sure that people always care about how you feel. We, it is much easier for us to care about how we feel than it is to care about how others feel. To care about how others feel is empathy. But not everybody is equipped with the ability to be empathetic. They can be selfish. <laughs> they can be narcissistic. They can be tied into themselves. And sometimes when your feelings are wounded and you're surrounded by people that are oblivious, willingly or unwillingly to how you feel, you are alone even in a crowd. Now, Jesus is preparing his disciples to take over the world, and he does not want them to be petty. So he says, it is impossible for you to not have offense. It is impossible. That means if you tip around and be real quiet and real sweet, and you always do nice things for everybody, and you're just as kind as Mother Teresa, that does not exempt you. You will still get offended. That means that if you change your hair and you change your dress, you will still get offended. If you don't believe it, go on social media. If you lose weight, they say you're too skinny. If you gain weight, they say you need to work out more. If you dress stylish, they say you need to be simple. If you dress simple, they say you need to freshen up. There's always somebody out of 8 billion people on the planet, you are going to get on somebody's nerves. I don't care what you do. And you can't manage 8 billion people's feelings. So Jesus does not want to raise up 12 disciples who think victory is managing how other people feel. Ooh, that was good. Because for some of you, victory is changing people's minds. And you think that if I do this well enough, long enough, right enough, left enough, short enough, get tips in my hair, get tents in my hair, get weaves in my hair, get my lips blown up, get my jaw sunk in, get my tummy tucked, and take my tummy and put it behind me, that when I... <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to say that out loud. I'm sorry. We're, we're always trying to manage what people think of us. And Jesus says, it is impossible. He just comes right out the top, slaps us right across the face. Bam! It's impossible for you to live your life and not have offense. So you might as well quit running from it. You might as well quit making it the achievement of your life to get everybody to like you. I don't care what you do, somebody's not going to like you. 
That was one of the greatest lessons my father taught me in an old red pickup truck that had a red bumper on it that he'd gotten from the junkyard and he was coming back from a job and I was coloring in the car and I was eight years old and I was having a father-son talk with him about some kid at school that didn't like me and he said, boy, I don't care what you do, everybody is not going to like you. Stay with me all of my life because all of us want to be liked and we want to be loved and we want to live our lives without offense because offense is stressful. It's stressful. It's stressful. Yeah, I know you say you don't care, but it's stressful. People will say stuff to you that will make your hair stop growing. And Jesus says clearly it is unavoidable. There is no way to live your life without offense. If you chew long enough, your teeth are going to bite your tongue. I know you married Harry and he's six foot two and fine and he's got biceps and triceps and recepts and deceps and everything all over him and he's so gorgeous and he treats you like a lady like you have never been treated before in all of your life. And I know he's so wonderful and he's so thoughtful and he's so kind. And when you looked through in his eyes, you saw all the way down into his heart and you knew that we would always love each other forever and ever and ever. Until you found out that he leaves his socks on the floor and he left his dirty underwear in the bathroom and all of a sudden you'll get an attitude about the way he smacks his food at the table. Can you please shut your mouth when you chew? You're cute, but you got no manners. It's true. You're going to have a fence. You're going to have a fence. It's going to happen sometime. It's going to happen to you sometime. You're going to go through some things. But God cares about your emotional well-being. Because if you get emotionally off, it affects everything else. When we go on an interview, they want to know our IQ, our intellectual quotient. How intelligent are you? There is a measurement whereby we can measure the quotient whereby your intelligence exists. Okay? But there is also an EQ whereby you can begin to evaluate the emotional quotient. Don't slip over this, write this down. Because a lot of people with great IQs have poor EQs. And you hire the intelligence, but you got to live with the EQ. And by the time they get through wreaking havoc on your job, in your life, in your marriage with your kids, you would take somebody with a lower IQ if they had a little bit higher EQ. Can I get a witness up in here somewhere? You find out she's cute, but she's crazy. <laughs> she is built like a Coke bottle, but she is empty as a beer drum. And you find yourself in this situation where you got these people because you don't end up married to their IQ, you end up living with their EQ. Yeah, and Jesus said people can get offended and how we manage the offense determines the outcome of our lives because there are no classes that teach us how to manage our EQ. There are no classes. They don't teach that in school, not even in universities. They don't teach you how to manage your emotions. They don't teach you that at home. They teach you your ABCs and which fork to use. I know which fork to use. My mother said, spent hours teaching me which fork to use. That's a salad fork. Don't eat with that fork. No, that's a dessert spoon. Eat with that dessert spoon. The dessert spoon goes above the plate. This is where the glass goes. This is where the bread goes. You got her bread plate. She taught me all that kind of stuff. I don't use none of that. I eat your food, my food, any food that gets in my proximity is at risk of termination. I wish she would have spent a little bit more time telling me how to manage emotions. Jesus says, if it's impossible to live without offense, 
we should talk to people more about offense rather than acting like, once you come to Jesus, you will never be offended. Nobody will ever get in your nerves and nobody will ever take your parking space. Some of you, before you get out of this building, somebody is going to get on your nerves and you got to be okay with it. You got to be able to deal with it because they're sitting up talking to somebody and they're holding up traffic and you got to go to work at seven o'clock in the morning and she's having a conversation and praying for somebody out of her car window and you can't get around her and all of a sudden your anointing dissipates out of your baby toe and your eyes turn red and your fangs come out and all of a sudden you know I'm right about it he cares so much about it he cares so much about it and when your feelings are wounded or hurt or in pain, the body, the human body, I've done a lot of research on this, the human body cannot differentiate between physical pain and emotional pain. The same secretions that come out of your body when you have emotional pain like breaking your leg are the same reactions that you have to a broken heart, but no medicine. And so there is no treatment. We can't reset it. We can't stabilize it. We can't bring it back to order. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and we get to eavesdrop on the conversation without the FBI. <laughs> we get to hear Jesus prepping his boys to go out and do kingdom work. And he's prepping them so that they won't be petty. Because you can't do great work, massive Promised land work with a petty attitude. You have to have thick skin to operate for the kingdom. You have to be strong to operate for the kingdom. You have to have some things in place that protect you because if you're not careful, the offense will become a distraction from the calling. And you'll put all your energy into settling the offense rather than focusing on the mission that the Lord has given you and your, uh, your wounded feelings will be your sand ballad and Tobiah and you'll give up on your calling and come down off your wall to have an argument with how you feel and you think you got the victory but you lost the victory because the disruption was a distraction from the purpose of God that was in your life. So you be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord and then he says I don't want you worrying about it because I'm going to deal with it he says it would have been better that a millstone be tied around your neck and you be cast into the sea than for you to hurt one of mine he kind of sounds like my mother my mother, I called my mother down to the school because I was having trouble at school and the vice principal said she was going to call my mother and I said, no, you're not going to call my mother. I'm going to call my mother. A few minutes later, this black woman pulled up in this green imperial with her wig on backwards. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being funny. This is the truth. Her wig was on backwards and her eyes were red like Dracula and she had fangs coming out of her mouth and I said, there's my mama. <laughs> it changed the whole meeting when mama got out the car. God said, I will ride up on you like your mama. If you hurt one of the least of mine, it would be better that a millstone be tied around your neck and you be cast into the sea than to hurt one of my people's feelings, their emotion. That ought to make you careful. That ought to make you scared. It ought to make you a, a, a steward a, with, with a fiduciary responsibility to manage the feelings of the people in your life so that you don't become a brute and careless with the way you talk to each other because God is watching how you talk to me and even though I don't get upset, he gets upset and vengeance is not mine but is his and the Lord says I will repay you if you mistreat not just the big people on the front row but the people where back in the balcony. He says, I care whatever you do to the least of mine, to the parking lot attendant, you have done it unto me. Oh, that's cool. 
That means God is my security. I don't have to have security. God is my security, that he's my protection. And that means that I don't have to fight back. That means the battle is not mine. It belongs to the Lord. It means I don't have to fill my heart with anger and getting even and coming up with schemes to get back at you or straighten you out. It means that the battle belongs to God and God will deal with you all by himself because he doesn't want me distracted from healing the sick and raising the dead and turning water into wine and preaching the gospel and loosening the bound and setting the captive free. He doesn't want me to be distracted from laying hands on people and seeing tumors dissipate out of their body. He doesn't want me to be distracted from my divine assignment to preach the gospel all over the world, to change the world, to win people to Jesus Christ. And I can't win you to a loving God with an angry heart. While I'm getting on your nerves, I might as well go a little deeper. He warns husbands, God cares how you treat your wife. God said, if you don't treat your wife a certain kind of way, he said, your prayers will be hindered. That's scary. God says, I will hinder your prayers. That means I'm watching, even though you're bigger than her, and even though she, in most cases, and AJ, uh, in most cases, uh, in, 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 in many cases, she, God says, I will defend her by shutting up the heavens and stop everything from going right because of the way you talk to her. And if you don't want your prayers hindered, he says, exercise whatever influence you have in a measured way because I'm watching. And I'm like the Lord. When I meet people for the first time and I don't know them, I don't watch how they treat important people. I watch how they treat people that they think are not important. I watch how they treat the waitress and the bus driver and the Uber driver and stuff like that because it lets me know how you would treat me if you ever got the upper hand. And I choose my friends by the way they treat people they think they don't need because the moment they stop needing you, they will treat you that way too. Oh, this is worth the whole message. This, that part right there is worth the whole message. So pay attention if you're trying to figure out who to date. Don't watch how, how he treats you. Everybody treats everybody good on a date. Look for some, how he treats the waitress. Look how, how he treats the person who parks your car. Look at how he talks to people that he thinks he doesn't need or that she thinks she doesn't need. And you'll have a clue into the rhythm with which she handles her emotion. Because one thing about crazy, it will peek out. It will sneak out. You might can cover it up for about a two or three days, but by that third week, it will start giving you glimpses. You know, I'm cute, but I will go off on you. And her head starts spinning around uh, like the exorcist, and she attacks the waitress just because the steak is too done. Just start taking notes right there. You are in trouble, boy. You're going to be in trouble. Jesus cares how you treat people you think you don't need. He's watching how you handle them. He's watching how you treat them. Anybody can treat somebody good when you want a loan, when you need an equity loan, when you need an investment, when you need a job, when you need some help, when you're trying to go up. But very few people take the time to respect the janitor, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the attendant. You got to treat people with the same dignity because that is the commandment of the Lord toward you. So when Jesus begins to talk about this, he talks about it from three perspectives. He talks about his protection, he talks about his purging, and he talks about his provision. His protection, his purging, and his prevention. And I just got to talking about how God protects you. You might, to the defenseless, to the broken, to the wounded, to the rejected, to the ostracized, to the person who has a scarlet letter on their head. I want you to lift up your head. Jesus is watching out for you. 
to the person who has no recourse and can't afford help and can't get the breakthrough that they need. Jesus is watching out for you. To the person who's tied up in an abusive relationship, Jesus is watching out for you. To the person who's mistreated on the job and in their neighborhood and in their life, Jesus is watching out for you. And you may not see it, but sooner or later, God is going to handle the person that's mishandling you. Glory to God. I feel like shouting right now. I feel like praising him right now. I feel like giving him the victory right now. Because if God be for you, he's more than the world against you. If God is on your side, he'll make a way out of no way. If God is on your side, he will stop the lion from biting you, the fire from burning you. He will stop the enemy from destroying you. He'll stop the snake from biting you. He'll stop the sea from drowning you. If God is on your side. He'll make a way in the middle of the desert. He'll bring you water out of a rock. He'll open up the Red Sea to get you across. If God is on your side, he'll heal you by lifting up a serpent in the wilderness. If God is on your side, you can fight the Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. If God is on your side, he will make a way out of no way. He'll put streams in the middle of your desert. If God is on your side, he will lift your head up. He will renew your strength. He will encourage your heart. He will renew your spirit. If God is on your side, he will bring you out from under the power of the enemy. He will heal you even when the doctor says no. If God is on your side, he will change the records in the accountant. He will lift your head up. He will make your feet as hinds feet. When you should have fell over, he'll stiffen you to be able to stand. If God is on your side. He'll bring your fever down. He'll bring your courage up. He'll strengthen your will and your tenacity. If God is on your side, somebody shout if God is on your side. So the first thing Jesus does is deal with the people who've been dealing with us who have injured us, not necessarily physically, but emotionally, to alleviate us from the responsibility and the heavy weight that vengeance takes on the human soul. It takes so much weight to be vengeful. And Satan tempts us to be vengeful, even if it's in little ways like rolling your eyes when they come in the room. And I will admit, I've had some struggles. Because when you get on my nerves, I kind of want you to know it. And I don't want to say anything where I can be quoted, but my eyes cannot be quoted. So I close my lips and go. And then he gets home to me and says, you don't have anything to do with that. I will handle that. And the moment he gets to addressing my enemies, now he now brings it home to me. So he moves away from just talking about protection to purging. And he says, if your brother has sinned against you or got ought against you or has hurt you or has offended offended you. And the reason I'm preaching about this is because we are living in an era of offense. Everybody's offended. You can't say nothing about nothing that don't make somebody mad. You can tweet two plus two is four and somebody will come back and say, who says who made you an expert on two plus two being four? It don't really have to be four. Everybody's offended. Rich folks are offended. Poor folks are offended. Black folks are offended. White folks are offended. Everybody's offended. The women are offended. The men are offended. Now we raised up a bunch of kids and the kids are offended. Everybody's offended. Now we got to live in the same house with a bunch of offended people. Everybody's got something against everybody. And then we come to church and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. 
you and your house aren't even speaking. Your daughter is mad at her mama. The dog bit the cat. The cat ate the goldfish. The husband and the wife ain't speaking. And don't you bring your mammy-in-law back over into this house on another Thanksgiving. I'll send her a plate. Everybody's offended. And we live in a society that makes a career at keeping us mad at each other. We live in a society that pits us against each other and tells us what each other thinks and we believe it. And so we get offended over what we heard somebody thought and how they think and how they feel. And they'll find one dumb somebody that represents that people group that'll come up and say something stupid. And then you'll judge millions and millions of people on that one individual and be offended over one individual. I've never seen such a time where you can't say anything. Everybody's offended. Everybody's upset. Everybody's nerves are on edge. Everybody's upset about something. You don't even know what you're upset about. We are living in the land of offense, and we have a God who has told us not to allow offense to get in our spirit because you can't have great worship and be offended. It affects your harmony flow. It affects your connectivity. It affects how the Holy Spirit invades the room. It matters whether you get along with the other singers. It matters whether the drummer likes a guitar player. It changes the atmosphere. When there's ought against your brother, the Bible said, leave your gift at the altar. I don't care how gifted you are. If you've got a bad attitude, God said, I don't want your gift until you get that bilateral connection, that horizontal connection together. God said, I don't want to hear no more vertical stuff coming out of your mouth as long as you're not speaking to the person that you're shouting beside. God says it does matter how you feel about one another. Can I go deeper? So then he says to the offended, he has moved away from the offender to talking to the offended. And when he talks to the offended, he talks to us about how to get the contamination out because it's easy to get contaminated. If there's no way to escape offense, then everybody in here has been offended at some time or another. Can we be honest? It's hard to get church people to be honest because we have our reputation at stake and we don't want anybody to know that we're human. But to all the real people in the room, hold your hand up if you've ever been offended. I have been offended. Sometimes I don't read the comments because when I'm offended, I have a tendency to say something back. And I got a struggle down inside of myself to shut up because I can think of a whole lot of good stuff to say back to you. And even when I do say something back, I have to edit it <laughs> so that I can keep my day job. Because if I let the full theory of what I could say back, just let it flow, hit the organ, Marcus. Marcus would have to play the organ behind me. When I got to telling you what I thought about you, I'd have to tune up. And so I have to shut my mouth. Now Jesus moves from talking to the offender to talking to the offended. And he says, if someone offends you and you confront them, I want to stop there because most of us don't have the courage to confront the person we're offended with. You can confront people without being confrontational. Burying stuff doesn't heal it. Covered wounds don't heal well. Oh, I struck something that time. I felt it. At least 10 couples had a seizure. I mean, an absolute, just an absolute, just a seizure right there on the floor. Covering it up will never make it better. You have to have the courage to speak up. And don't let anybody take your voice away. Don't let anybody out talk you to the point that they take your voice away. Because just because you out talk me doesn't mean you change my mind. Jesus said, confront them. And if they repent, forgive them. 
And the disciples was cool with that. They were cool with that. And then he messed around and said, and if they do it again and again and again and again and again, and then he gave them a number, 70 times 70. And they did some quick math and said, increase our faith. Because I'm good on like maybe a couple of times or three times or maybe even seven times. But when you go from addition to multiplication, I'm not sure that I don't need a touch of the Lord to help me to be able to do that. Because seven times 70, Lord, that's getting like, like way up into some big numbers there. And I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I love you and everything, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying that I won't do it, but I'm not sure that I will do it. And, and so I don't want to overcommit myself and I don't want to lie to you because you know everything from the beginning and I don't want to offend anybody but I just don't know if I can sign up for 7 times 70. Maybe 3 times 70 but 7 times 70 might be above my quota. <laughs> and then they said to him increase our faith. And I said to myself, what does faith have to do with forgiveness? The disciples saw faith and forgiveness interconnected. They said, in order for me to develop the ability, the ability to be able to purge my heart, of the way I feel, I need faith. I need to believe that nothing you did stopped me from getting there. I need to believe that my destiny is not altered by the things you said or did or left or didn't give me, I need to decide irrevocably that the, that, the, that the promises of God are yea and amen and that no man or no woman coming or going or leaving or staying or paying or caring can stop me from turning out at the destination that God has for me. In fact, I need to believe that it was good for me that I was afflicted. Some kind of way God used what you did to fertilize my dreams and I became stronger now and richer now and better now and fuller now and I've got to learn how to glory in tribulation I've got to dance when I'm falsely accused I've got to learn how to praise God even when you don't like me my defense is to believe God and say devil you meant it for evil but God made it good to God be the glory you threw me in the pit you threw me in Potiphar's house you put me in prison and I I landed the prince of Egypt. I still got to where I was trying to go. You didn't help me, but I made it. You lied on me, and I made it. You betrayed me, and I made it. You left me, and I made it. You excommunicated me from the family, and I made it. You said I was dead, but I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Is there anybody that made it back through something, and you've been through something, and all hell was breaking loose, and they thought you wouldn't go like Lazarus is back from the dead. I'm back like the woman with the issue of blood is healed from her infirmity. I'm back like Luke 13. I straightened up myself and got myself together. Now you talking about a victory when you've been through hell and thrown in a pit and made it out of a prison and been through a storm and been through a crisis and been alienated and rejected and land on your feet? You talking about a shout? You talking about a dance? You talking about wanting to run? You talking about wanting to leap? I wish I had 30 people that had been through something and God brought you out to put your hands together, open your mouth, dance on your feet, do a cartwheel, stand on your head, let hell know I made it anyway. I made it anyway to God be the glory for the things he has.
has done. We're going to make a declaration there. We're going to make a declaration tonight that's going to make demons run out of every exit door in the room. We're going to make a declaration tonight that brings depression out of your spirit. Suicide is going to have to flee out of this room. Anxiety and hypertension is going to have to get up and get out of here. Glory to God. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm going to be all right. Tell your other neighbor, I'm going to be all right. Hell gets nervous. Hell gets nervous when you start talking faith. Demons start trembling when you start talking faith. Witches lose their power when you start talking faith. Sickness loses its grip when you start talking faith. High blood pressure comes down when you start talking faith. Tumors shrink in your body when you start talking faith. I wish I had 30 seconds of crazy supernatural Holy Ghost. but I'm a land on my feet. I'm looking for a job, but I'm a land on my feet. I'm not sure I got the student loan, but I'm a land on my feet. I'm nervous about going to class, but I'm a land on my feet. I started my own business, but I'm a land on my feet. I don't have enough capital, but I'm a land on my feet. I'm raising my kids by myself, but I'm a land on my feet. This is the first time I've tried to own something, but I'm going to land on my feet. If you don't help me, I'll land on my feet. If you don't stand with me, I'll land on my feet. If you lie on me, I'll land on my feet. If you scandalize my name, I'll land on my feet. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm talking to somebody tonight. The Lord sent me all the way from Dallas, Texas to tell you, you're going to land on your feet. You're going to land on your feet. You're going to land on I'm not through yet. Sit with me. I'm just getting hot now. Glory to God. I just kicked into the zone, baby. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Don't you see them devils running out that door right now? Don't you see them devils leaping out of that window? Don't you see them devils getting back out of the way? When Jesus says, none but the pure in heart shall see God, the word pure comes from a Greek word where we get cath. Catharus is the word. The root word is cath, where we get catheter. None but the pure in heart. Nobody but the people who have a catheter in their heart shall see God. A catheter whereby they measure the heart to make sure that the heart is flowing blood properly and there's no blockages. A catheter, I won't tell you about the other usage, but. <laughs> All the men said, ouch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The catheters are designed that you have a flow. And God says, I want your heart to be open to a flow. And I don't want you to allow any blockages to get in your heart because if you allow a blockage to get in your heart, it will stop you from seeing God. None but the pure in heart shall see God. If that's not enough motivation to make you get it out of you, 
I don't know what he is. I'm not sure whether he meant none but the pure in heart shall go to heaven. But I am sure that he means you won't be able to see God in your situation if your heart is blocked up with unforgiveness. And I need to see God to figure out how to make it through the wilderness so I can move when he moves, so I can walk when he walks, so I can flow when he flows, so I can step when he steps. I got to see God if I don't see you because he shows me the path. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. And if I let something get in my catheter, a catheter in my heart will affect my eyes. God says, none but the pure in heart shall see God. God says, if you get it in your heart, it will hinder your vision. So the enemy sends things to get in your heart to shut down your vision. Oh, my God. This is so good, I'm going to shout off my own preaching. God said, I made your heart to flow. I made your heart to flow unrestricted. I don't want you to gather plaque or anything else that slows the flow because everything God does is in a flow. Everything God created was in a flow. When God created the earth, he created it in a flow. And the rivers fed the streams, and the streams fed the lakes, and the lakes fed the ocean. And God didn't create new water. He just let his flow. It goes up, it rains down. It goes up, it rains down. It's a flow. Everything God created has a flow. When God created man from the dust of the earth, he didn't have to keep creating blood. He let the blood flow through the most elaborate highway system that you call the cardiovascular system your blood was made to flow and I don't have to check your heart to see if your flow is right I can touch your wrist and tell what's going on in your heart because the pulse the rhythm of your pulse tells me the activity of your heart and God said if things are shutting down the first thing I want you to do is check your heart what have you allowed to get in your heart that has closed down your vision so if I was the devil and I wanted to shut down your vision, I wouldn't have to attack your eyes. If none but the pure in heart shall see God, then all I'd have to do is contaminate your heart until you lost your vision. And if you lost your vision, you couldn't find your way out. And the reason Jesus says seven times 70 isn't a particular number that he's after. He's talking about keeping your heart open so that whatever happens, you keep flowing. You keep flowing. You might have the feeling, but as quickly as you can, you let it flow out. You don't let things stay in and contaminate you and block you up. Let me show you how quick Jesus was. They beat him until he was unrecognizable. They beat him until his entrails were hanging out. They beat him so long that Josephus says he should have died on the whipping post. But had he died on the whipping post, we wouldn't have been redeemed. Because the Bible said, cursed is he that hangs on the tree, not the whipping post. So he fought death on the whipping post, refusing to die. But when they hung him high and stretched him wide and nailed him in his right hand and nailed him in his left wrist and nailed his feet together, and when they put him up on the cross, Jesus is not on the cross cussing at them, yelling at them, telling them, I curse your unborn children. I curse your future. I curse your destiny. I curse your mama. Jesus didn't say that. I probably would have said that. Jesus didn't say Don't judge me. J Jesus wouldn't say that. Instead of allowing them to contaminate his heart, while they are killing him, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what 
they do. He said, I'm going to keep my heart open. No matter what I go through, I'm going to keep loving. I'm going to keep my nature. You're not going to change my nature from being the person that I am. You're not going to turn the lamb into a lion. I could call 10,000 angels and kill every last one of you, but I'm not going to do it because a lion cannot deliver the people. I've got to be a lamb to get this done. And in order to be a lamb, I got to forgive you while you're sticking nails in my hand. Oh my God, the shouting stuff. Glory to God. I wish I had me a shouting church in here right now. I'm going to outsmart the devil. I'm going to outsmart the devil. You're trying to change my nature. You're trying to turn me into a lion, but I can't redeem as a lion. I can only redeem as a lamb. And in order to be a lamb, even though you're nailing me, I'm going to forgive you because I understand that it's not you that's doing it. It's the spirit of the enemy that's working through you. And I ask my father to forgive you for hurting me because I know it really wasn't you. If you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't hurt me like that. You're just carrying out orders, and the orders are coming from Satan, and I'm under attack, and why would I fight the soldier when the war is not with the soldier, it's with the enemy, and the enemy's trying to get me to mess up what I'm about to do on the cross. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the enemy's trying to mess up what you're about to do in your ministry, and the reason you're up under attack is that he wants you to contaminate your heart, and the Lord said me from Talos to tell you don't you do it. Don't get bitter. Don't get even. Don't get mad. Don't get upset. Don't respond. Don't react. Hold your peace. I know you look weak. I know you look helpless. I know you know something you could say. I know you can fight. I know you can defend yourself. But this is not a battle that you're going to win with your fist. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. The weapons that we use are not carnal. You've got a weapon to fight with and there Jesus is bleeding to death on the cross talking about Father, forgive them. He's interceding for murderers. Glory to God. That's what he means by seven times seven. Later in the scriptures he will tell us Let's a root of bitterness defile you. A root, a root of bitterness defile you. They gave him frankincense and myrrh, which was roots. So there are roots that can anesthetize the pain. And there are other roots that can defile. Are you carrying a root of bitterness? Because if you are, it will defile you. I'm almost where I want to be. You still with me? You're not tired of me yet? And and so they said, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith till we believe you when our feelings are hurt. Anybody can believe you when they're happy. Increase our faith till we believe you when we're in pain, when the nails are in our wrist, when we've been publicly humiliated, when we are at our wit's end. Increase our faith to believe that some good is going to come out of this. I remember one time I was under attack and it was real bad and it was real painful. And it's the only time in my life I've ever been curled up in the corner of the floor crying and, and just, just beside myself. And I took a walk in my backyard and I was crying and I was walking in the backyard and I was talking to God and I said, I don't know why you let this happen to me. And I don't know why you're letting this go on in my life. And I don't know why you allowed me to go through what I'm going through. I said, but I want you to know that I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. 
And if you ordered me to go through this, I'll go through whatever you want me to go through to be whoever you want me to be because I know you love me and I know you know what's best for me. And though you slay me, yet will I trust you. And I was crying and I couldn't hardly even see the path I was walking on. But I told God, I will pass this test because I trust you. I trust you when things go right. I trust you when things go wrong. I trust you when you make me happy. I trust you when you make me cry because I am convinced because of Calvary that you're in love with me and you can't be in love with me and do something that's going to end up bad and I trust you I trust you with tears running down my face I trust you and the more I said I trust you the more demons begin to scream and shake I trust you I don't understand you but I trust you I don't see the plan but I trust you you've broken my heart but I trust you it's painful but I trust you I want to speak to everybody who's ever lost anybody lost anything lost a loved one went through a hard time you don't have to understand God to trust him you need to let hell know I trust him I trust him that some kind of way this is going to work for my good if you've been going through a very painful place slip your hands up in the air and give God a praise that you trust him I trust you I trust you in this season. I trust you in this season. I trust you when I lose my job. I trust you when my loan isn't approved. I trust you when people rise up against you. I trust you when things didn't turn out the way I wanted them to turn out. I trust you when I didn't bring a medal home from the Olympics. I trust you when I fumbled the ball on the field. I still trust you. I trust you. Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Order my steps in your word. Order my steps in your word dear Lord order your order my steps in your word order my steps in your word somebody stomp your foot order my steps order my steps order my steps order my steps I won't break my cadence I won't break my flow I won't break my movement I won't break my regimen I won't break my future I'm gonna keep on doing what you told me to do dry these tears up I can't stop crying you gotta dry these tears up but if you dry them up I I'll preach for you. If you dry them up, I'll sing for you. If you dry them up, I'll dance for you. If you dry them up, I'll shout for you. If you dry them up, I'll sing for you. If you dry them up, I'll run for you. If you dry them up, I'll leap for you. If you dry them up, I'll preach the gospel all over the world. If you dry them up, I'll teach Bible class in other nations and countries. If you dry them up, I'll help the poor. If you dry them up, I'll feed the hungry. If you dry them up, I'll clothe the naked. If you dry them up, so he deals with us is this good so so he dealt with us protection he dealt with us with purging and then he deals with us with prevention and this is the prevention part and it's kind of weird he says if you have the faith increase our faith Lord they thought the bigger the faith the better the fight and Jesus says, not going to take that much faith. He said, if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed. Now watch this. Before he said, you shall speak to the mountain and the mountain shall be cast into the sea. But this time he said, if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed, you shall speak to a sycamine tree and command it to be cast into the ocean and it will be cast into the ocean and it will be removed. And I said, why did you go from a mountain to a tree? And he said, because a mountain has no roots. So I started digging into a sycamine tree. And I want to tell you, can I tell you, can I tell anybody? Anybody want to know what a sycamine? A sycamine tree is a very unique tree. It's not that the roots grow deep, only about 24 inches deep into the earth, but they grow wide. They grow very wide. They take over territory. And when they grow wide, they twist and tangle. And so it is almost impossible to uproot the tree because the roots are twisted and wide. So when a sycamine tree is growing, 
it is not the trunk you have to worry about. It's the root. And Jesus is saying, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. God said, if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed, I will demolish the system that has you stuck. <clears throat> you tried to shake yourself loose and you couldn't get loose. You tried to pray yourself loose and you couldn't get loose. You tried to talk yourself out of it and you couldn't get loose. The reason you couldn't get loose is that your roots are intertwined. The only thing that will untangle your roots is your conviction of faith in God. He said, if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed, I will untangle the system. <laughs> Can I go into the system? You're hurt over your husband because your husband hurt you, but it's rooted into something that happened with your father. And now all of a sudden, everybody that reminds you of your father gets tied into the system. And now you're raising a son and he's taking on characteristics like your ex-husband. And the enemy is tangling your roots. Am I helping somebody? If I'm helping you, holler at me. If you will notice your life has a system of attack. There is something consistent in the DNA of the things that happen to you. It is the roots of the sycamine tree. And they get tangled up until you can't take what you can't tell one from another. And the same thing that happened to you before is happening to you again. And the thing that happened to your father is happening to you. And the thing that your uncle went through is now happening to your son. And you can see a pattern because the sycamine roots go wide. They go wide. They touch your father. They touch your wife. They touch your son. They touch your nephew. They touch your nieces. They affect your job. They affect your economy. They affect your leadership. They affect every area of your life. It affects how you handle money. It affects your business. It affects your future because the roots are intertwined. That's why Jesus didn't ask for the mountain because when it comes to forgiveness, mountains don't have roots. And unforgiveness has roots, and the roots are the roots of bitterness. And the bitterness gets so entangled that sometimes you even forget what you're mad about. You're just angry. It's all tangled up together. But the Holy Spirit said tonight, I'm going to untangle your roots. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to bring you to a place of wholeness. I'm going to bring you to a place of healing. I'm going to bring you to a place of restoration. I'm going to untangle patterns that have been going on for generations and generations in your life. This didn't even start with you. This started with your mother and your grandmother. This started with your grandfather and your granddaddy. And the roots have gone wide. And your past is trying to reach over and mess up your future. But the devil is a lie. This is going to be a root untangling service. This is going to be a root untangling meeting. You're watching on the internet. Your roots are about to be untangled. Things that have been in your life and you couldn't get loose and they're all in the ground and it's everywhere and it's all tied up and it's around rocks and it's around ridges and it's around dry places and you love the Lord but you can't get loose and you love Jesus but you can't get loose and you love your son but you can't tell him and you love your wife but you can't express it and you love what you do but all hell is breaking loose on your job and it's affecting every area of your life. If you're seeing the same spirit show up in different dimensions of your life, it's because your life is the sycamine tree. But the Lord sent me here tonight to preach a liberating word that's about to loose you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Somebody jump up on your feet like you lost your mind. Give me more power. 
Somebody jump up on your feet like you lost your mind. Somebody jump up on your feet like you lost your mind. Somebody jump up on your feet like you lost your mind. Somebody jump up on your feet like you lost your mind. Yes, 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 yes. You've been a prisoner in your own head. You've been a prisoner in your own emotion. You've been a prisoner in your own thoughts. It's not that you don't look free on the outside. Good morning. Welcome to J.C. Penney's. It doesn't look like everything is going well. It looks like everything is going fine. But you know that down on the inside, you've been tangled up in your mind, in your spirit. And late at night when everybody else is asleep, you're awake at night. It's affecting your rest. It's affecting your peace. It's affecting your mind. But tonight is your night. That's why the devil didn't want you to get in here tonight because tonight is your night for a breakthrough the spirit of the living God 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 is in this place tonight we're going to take the faith as of a grain of mustard seed look at your neighbor and say you just need a little bit of faith you just need a little bit of faith. <laughs> Type it on the line. You just need a little bit of faith. If you get out a little bit of faith tonight, God's going to destroy the system that's trying to destroy you. The odds are against you. The roots are against you. The situation is against you. The times are against you. But greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. There's a greater power that's about to take over your life. There's a greater power that's about to heal your mind, your body, your emotions, your health, your rest. The Spirit of God is in this place. I serve notice on every devil in this place tonight. You have no more territory. We will give you no more space. We will give you no more room. We will give you no more power. Somebody's eyes are opening up. Somebody's vision is coming back. Somebody's commitment is being stirred. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Can I, oh, can I preach like I do at home? I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel a screaming of demonic warfare that's been working a system against you all of your life. You're not bound. You're not tied. You're not tangled. You're not an inmate. You're not alone. You've been feeling by yourself, but the Holy Ghost said you're not by yourself. God is getting ready to demolish the whole system, and not only is he going to pull the tree up, but he's going to cast it into the sea. If you're in this place and you got something that needs to be cast into the sea, if you're in this place and you've been carrying a pain that's too much for you to bear, if you're in this place and you've been wounded for a while, I want you to seize the anointing that is in this room to untangle yourself and set yourself free where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. There's going to be liberty in this place tonight. There's going to be liberty online. Every time you try to make a move, the devil tries to shut you down. But the devil is a lie. God is about to uproot that thing out of your life and set you free. I need a hundred people in this room that feel God pulling the sick of tree out of your life to give God a praise. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place. I gotta be free. I gotta come out of this. I gotta get loose. I gotta be whole. I gotta be delivered. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get me out of this. I gotta be free. I didn't come this far to be bound. I didn't come this far to be tangled. I didn't come this far to be blind. I didn't come this far to go back. Never you a liar. Tonight is my night. In the name of Jesus, I declare liberty all over this house for the next three minutes. Everything that got a praise, get it out. Lose your job. Lose your 
finances, lose your peace, lose your joy, lose your vision, lose your anointing, lose your calling. I can't Tonight, the defense for an offense is the discovery of mustard seed faith. If you believe God just a little bit, the entire system, there's a system working against you. There's a system working against you. The way you were raised, the things you came through, the things that happened to you were all designed to take over territory. God is going to move the tree. I want everybody in this place that this message spoke to in a special way. And you said, my God, that man is talking to me. God put an anointing on me for you. You might be watching online, but the anointing is for you. You don't have to spend the rest of your life tied up to a dead root. Young people, you don't have to start your life off entangled and angry and bitter and hurt. There are some young people in here with old people's problems. You've seen stuff that a young person should have never seen. You've been through things that people your age should have never gone through. And you are here under duress against all odds it's a miracle that you're here and God wants to pull your sycamine tree up by the root there are couples in here you were meant to be power couples in the kingdom of God and that's why the enemy fights you so and you've been hurt and you haven't been able to get over the hurt you've said all the right things but the rooting system is so complicated that you're tied to it there are people in this room who have incurred injuries, betrayals, disappointments that left you wounded. And every time you see certain people, you feel a certain way, but you smile and you hide it. The enemy is trying to plant a root on you. If you are in any of those categories, come as close to this altar as you can. Don't worry about what you got on. Don't worry about what people say. Don't worry about what they think. Don't worry about it. 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 The only thing we want, the only thing we want is to untangle this root. We got to untangle this root. This root is wide. This root is long. This root is complicated. This root is far-fetched. 
and you love Jesus and you worship Jesus and you praise Jesus but you go home and you wrestle with this root and it's a root of loneliness and it's a root of anger and it's a root of lust and it's a root of unforgiveness and it's a root of anger and the enemy keeps telling you what you would have had if things would have been different because he's trying to kill your faith that God can get you there anyway that you can be in the pit that you can be in Potiphar's house that you can be in the prison and still end up the prince but the Lord sent me here tonight to tell you that your destiny is secure, that God is gonna bring you into the fullness of his purpose and he's gonna uproot that sycamine tree, that rooting system, the things they said, the things they did, the things you heard that brought you to where you are right now. You're a king's kid. You're on the verge of deliverance. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is here right now. And God is about to do something amazing in your life. Glory to God. Glory to God. They're still coming. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't let your pride hold you in your seat. Don't let your fear hold you back. You're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And God is going to give you a pure heart so you can see him. So you can see him. Before this year is out, you're going to see God in a way you never saw him before. You're going to love God in a way you never loved him before. You're going to reach God in a way you never reached him before. Before this year is out, God is going to uproot that tree. That bitterness is going to go. That anger is going to go. That frustration is going to go. Lift your hands up and open your mouth. The Spirit of God is in this place. Father, these are your sons and these are your daughters. These are your people. These are your children. Like a mama fights for a child, you will fight for them. You will go to war for them. You will battle for them. Their enemies become your enemies. I cast all my cares on you right now. I will not carry this another day. I will not carry it another day. I will not lay up at night thinking about it. I will rebuke the images, the pictures, the memories, the scars, the constant rehearsing of how I got wounded and how I got hurt. I reserve my feelings for praise. I reserve my feelings for worship. I reserve my feelings for love. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mind. I feel glory coming in the room. I feel glory coming in the room. Here comes a wave of glory. It's all in the aisle. It's all on the internet. It's all on the tube. I feel a glory coming. I feel a glory coming. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, Your hands are free. Move your feet. Your feet are free. Your heart is free. Your vision is free. Now open your mouth and give God. Tonight the Holy Ghost said, get out of your feelings. 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 The enemy's been trying to contaminate you. He's always talking to you about how you feel about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. The only thing that matters is what you believe about it. I want you to turn and loose what you believe and turn it on what you feel and let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 